Good day. My name's Tony Hanbidge. I'm an abdominal imager at the University of Toronto. And today I'm going to present a talk on a common everyday condition, the patient from the emergency room with acute right upper quadrant pain. Imaging the patient with acute right upper quadrant pain. Acute abdominal and pelvic pain is the most common presenting symptom to our emergency departments in North America today, accounting for approximately 7% of all such visits. Right upper quadrant pain is a common and important subset of these patients, but finding the exact uh, cause is a clinical challenge. Generally, after the initial assessment, the gallbladder and bile ducts emerge as prime suspects. But diagnosis based on the clinical assessment and simple laboratory tests is frequently inaccurate, so imaging is critical to management. Ultrasound should always be the initial imaging test for these patients. It's accurate, safe, inexpensive, available, and portable and indeed can be performed at the patient's bedside in the emergency department. So our learning objectives for this presentation are to discuss the value of ultrasound in assessing the patient with acute right upper quadrant pain. We will identify the imaging features of acute cholecystitis and its complications and we will describe other conditions that can cause acute pain in the right upper quadrant when the gallbladder is normal. Now we're all very familiar with the requisition from the emergency room physician rule out acute cholecystitis. But in fact less than half of these patients will in fact have acute cholecystitis or its complications and there's a whole array of other conditions that can mimic um, such as cholelithiasis and ascending cholangitis, recurrent pyogenic cholangiohepatitis, liver abscess, and rupture with hemorrhage of liver masses, to name some. Now, the ultrasound appearances of acute cholecystitis have been well described, and ultrasound has an accuracy of approximately 88%, which is similar to scintigraphy. But ultrasound has advantages such as identifying complications of acute cholecystitis or offering alternate diagnosis if the gallbladder is normal. Scintigraphy is also more time consuming. Now 90 to 95 percent of patients with acute cholecystitis will have gall stones. The stones cause a uh, obstruction of the gallbladder neck or cystic duct, uh, variable degrees of infection and necrosis ensue as the gallbladder distends, patients present with right upper quadrant pain, tenderness and guarding, and there's a whole spectrum of clinical presentations from mild to quite dramatic. The most sensitive uh, combination of sonographic findings are maximal tenderness over the sonographically localized gallbladder in the presence of gall stones. And uh, Phil Rowles uh, had a paper published in Radiology in 1985 which uh, showed a positive predictive value of 92% for this combination of findings in a prospective study of almost 500 patients. Gallbladder distension, diffuse wall thickening, and pericholecystic fluid are secondary findings that are neither sensitive or specific. But I'd like to draw attention to gallbladder distension and share with you our first teaching pearl for today, and that is to be reluctant to diagnose acute uncomplicated cholecystitis if the gallbladder is not tensely distended. Here's an example of a middle-aged woman from the emergency department with acute right upper quadrant pain. We identify gall stones. 
We slide the probe down. The patient is maximally tender over the sonographically localized gallbladder. Note that the gallbladder is tensely distended. Note also that the gallbladder wall is not particularly thickened. But the combination of findings here in this clinical context are highly suggestive of acute cholecystitis. Another teaching pearl is in these patients pay particular attention to the region of the gallbladder neck and cystic duct looking for the obstructing stone. And if you uncover such a stone, it will add confidence to your diagnosis and make you even more secure in strongly suggesting acute cholecystitis as the cause of the patient's pain. Here's another example with a similar clinical history. We see stones in the gallbladder lumen. The patient was maximally tender over the sonographically localized gallbladder. The gallbladder is tensely distended, and in this case, there is wall thickening with an edematous gallbladder wall. Once again, pay attention to the region of the gallbladder neck and cystic duct, and in the same patient, now using a different acoustic window, we've moved the probe up and are scanning intercostally. We've unfolded the gallbladder neck and uncovered the obstructing stone. So once again, this adds confidence to the diagnosis. Another teaching pearl relates to the fact that most gallbladders today are removed laparoscopically. And whether we're imaging the gallbladder in an acute or an elective setting, we must always remember the possibility of underlying gallbladder cancer, as most surgeons um, feel uh, that they would be much better prepared if they are aware of the possibility of an underlying gallbladder cancer before the gallbladder is removed uh, through the laparoscopic uh, ports. And the reason for this is there is a propensity for gallbladder cancer to recur at the laparoscopic ports if uh, proper precautions are not taken. And here's an example. Three months post-elective cholecystectomy, there was an underlying unsuspected gallbladder cancer, and we can see recurrence at the right upper quadrant port site and the umbilical port site in this patient. So when this retired obstetrician presented to me with acute right upper quadrant pain, I did this ultrasound. We documented gall stones. There was maximal tenderness over the sonographically localized gallbladder. The gallbladder wall uh, is thickened. The gallbladder is distended. So I felt quite comfortable that there was acute cholecystitis. But this additional um, echogenic material within the gallbladder lumen caused me some concern as I didn't want to overlook the possibility of an associated gallbladder cancer. And in this case, I recommended a CT scan to help clarify. And on the CT scan, we see some high attenuation within the gallbladder lumen, which was present on the unenhanced images and simply represents the gall stones. Following contrast, we can see enhancement of the gallbladder mucosa. It looks thin and smooth. There's a small breach in the mucosa, which suggests early gangrenous change. And then we see quite marked uh, pericholocystic inflammatory change. So I was quite satisfied that all the findings here could be explained on the basis of inflammation. I didn't see an enhancing tumor mass. And she went on to have a non-eventful uh, cholecystectomy, which confirmed the diagnosis. That brings us on to gangrenous cholecystitis, which can occur in uh, up to 2 to 38% of cases of acute cholecystitis. With ultrasound, look for asymmetric thickening of the gallbladder wall. Look for intraluminal membranes. Remember that as the gallbladder undergoes uh, necrotic change, the sonographic Murphy sign uh, may become negative in up to two-thirds of patients, and the symptoms and signs shift away from the right upper quadrant. This is such a case. A patient presented with abdominal pain for a week, 
The pain was somewhat nondescript. There was a concern regarding uh, urinary tract calculi. So this re unenhanced renal colic CT scan was performed. The uh, urinary tract was unremarkable, but on these slightly narrowed windows, we can see a fairly distended gallbladder with a high attenuation linear line within the gallbladder lumen. This raised our suspicions of gallbladder pathology, and uh, as is appropriate, an ultrasound was performed which showed a distended gallbladder with a fluid debris level and sloughing of the mucosal membranes and asymmetric wall thickening. We made a diagnosis of gangrenous cholecystitis, which was confirmed at surgery. Now, here is another case. CT was performed uh, on this occasion to rule out a bowel obstruction in a patient uh, with uh, uh, vague and indeterminate abdominal pain. And I was working with a very good fellow uh, on this particular day who said to me, well, this patient doesn't have bowel obstruction. This patient has acute cholecystitis. And I immediately said, well, not so fast. This gallbladder is not tensely distended. And when we look more closely at the gallbladder fossa, we can see the gallbladder, but in fact, there's a second uh, cystic collection in the gallbladder fossa. And when we analyze the images more closely, we realize that this gallbladder has perforated and is actually decompressed and is therefore not tensely distended. And there's now the formation of a pericholecystic abscess. So how common is gallbladder perforation? Well, it occurs in 5 to 10 percent of all cases of acute cholecystitis, and it's an important condition because it carries a significant mortality rate of 19 to 24 percent if not promptly treated. Uh, there are three types. Uh, it can be acute, where it happens very abruptly and you get a very generalized peritonitis. It can be subacute, where the inflammatory process is walled off by the greater omentum and a pericholecystic abscess forms, or a more chronic type where the inflammation is more indolent and uh, other structures may stick on to the gallbladder, such as the duodenum or the colon, and an internal biliary fistula may form to these structures. The most common type is the subacute type where pericholecystic abscesses form and the most common site for perforation in the gallbladder is uh, towards the gallbladder fundus. So here's an example, a patient with a one-week history of abdominal pain and fever. Uh, we see a large stone in the region of the gallbladder neck, but note that the gallbladder is not tensely distended. And when we look in the region of segment 5 of the liver, there's another complex cystic mass. Looking more closely at that mass, it has the appearance of a liver abscess, uh, certainly in this patient with right upper quadrant pain and fever. And when we return and look a little more closely at the region of the gallbladder and analyze the gallbladder itself in more detail, we can actually identify the site of perforation with an abscess developing in the adjacent liver. Again, on these patients, our interventional radiologists like a CT scan to better show the full extent of abscess formation. And here the CT nicely confirms the sonographic uh, findings. And if we look uh, more closely again at the gallbladder, the CT also shows the site of perforation. And the literature uh, tells us that ultrasound and CT are equally sensitive in this regard at uh, documenting the site of perforation. Now, what about emphysematous cholecystitis, uh, a rare but important condition caused by gas-forming bacteria? Gallstones are often absent, and many patients are diabetic, about 38%, so it's a condition that also occurs in non-diabetic uh, patients more common in men than women, and an important condition because of the much higher uh, gangrenous and uh, uh, perforation rates 
with their associated uh, higher morbidities and uh, mortalities. Here's an example, uh, the best view we could get of the gallbladder. And here we see a very echogenic curvilinear line corresponding with the gallbladder wall. Difficult to say with certainty from that appearance whether that's calcium or gas, but the reverberation artifact from the wall is very suggestive of gas. So this appearance is highly suggestive of an emphysematous cholecystitis that is easily confirmed with a CT scan performed the same day showing gas in the gallbladder lumen and the gallbladder wall. So this is an important condition that requires rapid uh, treatment to cut down on the morbidity and mortality. Now how does that appearance uh, compare with uh, the appearance uh, on the image on your right where we see a necogenic line, which is the gallbladder wall, and then a second echogenic interface, which are stones filling the gallbladder lumen. And then we get a very clearly defined dark shadow, typical of the shadowing we see from calcification. So this is how we distinguish a gallbladder filled with stones from emphysematous cholecystitis and this appearance on the right is known as the wall echo shadow complex or the WESS complex. And that brings us to a third case on your immediate right. What does this appearance represent? And when we analyze this image, we can see that the wall of the gallbladder here really is indistinguishable from the appearance of the air in the gallbladder wall in the initial case which I showed you. But the teaching point is that the truth lies with the shadow. And the shadow is the shadow we see from calcification. So this is a calcified gallbladder wall or a porcelain gallbladder which uh, was confirmed with CT. And this condition has been associated with a much higher rate of development of gallbladder cancer. So certainly in younger patients, porcelain gallbladder may be a reason for cholecystectomy. Now here's another older patient. It was an inpatient in uh, our hospital um, who presented with uh, right upper quadrant pain. These are the best images of the region of the gallbladder fossa and these images show a large calcification or large stone in the region of the gallbladder uh, surrounded by uh, isoechoic uh, likely soft tissue thickening. And in the context of pain and fever, we interpreted this as more likely an inflammatory uh, mass with a goldstone than a neoplastic uh, mass. The patient returned to the floor, was treated conservatively, and the surgeon came to speak to us a couple of days later and told us that the character of the patient's pain had changed, had become more diffuse, and that the abdomen had become distended. We felt a CT scan might offer additional uh, uh, information. And on the CT scan, we can now see uh, gas within the gallbladder lumen. There's pneumobilia. And when we look at the bowel, we can recognize that the large stone that was within the gallbladder has now migrated through a fistulous communication with the duodenum along into the small bowel with associated uh, bowel wall thickening. So this is now a goldstone ileus accounting for the patient's uh, symptoms. Here's another example of goldstone ileus where we can identify dilated bowel loops with air fluid levels. We notice uh, the gallbladder lumen filled with gas and the CT nicely shows the fistulous communication uh, with the duodenum and the obstructing stones in the distal ileum, which is the most common location for obstruction in this uh, condition. Here's another patient who presented with projectile vomiting and abdominal pain, and the image on your left is the best view we could get of the gallbladder fossa. We had an appearance there, we felt, of gas 
Within the region of the gallbladder fossa, we couldn't confidently identify stones. But immediately adjacent to the gallbladder was this peristalsing fluid-filled tubular structure with a stone. And again, we suspected that perhaps there was a high GI obstruction from a migrated uh, uh, gallstone. So we recommended a CT scan to further uh, investigate this possibility. And here we can see a stone within the duodenum and more distally a second stone obstructing a proximal jejunal loop. And when we go back we can see gas within the gallbladder lumen and in this case a fluid uh, filled fistulous communication with the duodenum. And of course a, a stone obstructing the duodenum uh, uh, that has migrated from the gallbladder is known as Bouveret syndrome. Another condition that's very rare but may be becoming more common is gallbladder torsion. It occurs in fragile elderly patients, the majority are women. It's a difficult uh, diagnosis because it is uh, uncommon and it comes in two varieties, an incomplete torsion or a complete torsion and only the minority of patients have stones. Here's an example. Uh, the ultrasound on your left was performed in a 94-year-old patient with abdominal pain and we identified the cystic structure which was actually down overlying the um, bifurcation of the aorta. It has an edematous wall but we didn't actually establish that it was arising from the um, gallbladder fossa. We did assess it with color Doppler. There was no flow within it. It was only when the CT scan was performed that we actually recognized this structure had a neck arising out of the gallbladder fossa with some beading and when we carefully analyzed the axial images we can see the cystic artery here uh, with some torsion of the gallbladder neck around the artery an incomplete torsion with a twist of approximately 180 degrees. Now what about pitfalls and mimics? Well here's a young woman with acute right upper quadrant pain and we can see the white arrows outlining a very markedly thickened and edematous gallbladder wall. The patient was fairly diffusely tender in the right upper quadrant but note that this gallbladder is not tensely distended. In fact the lumen is almost completely obliterated and we could not see any gall stones. We also look at the periportal triads and we note periportal edema. It uh, uh, got us to check the patient's clinical chart and of course the transaminases were markedly elevated so this patient has acute hepatitis. It's always important to know your patient. It's important to go speak to the patient and review their chart so that you interpret these studies with the full complement of available clinical information. The image on your left is another older patient with a slightly distended gallbladder but no stones. The gallbladder wall is edematous, there's pericholocystic fluid and the clue in this case uh, lies in the inferior vena cava which is quite distended as were the hepatic veins and the liver margin looks a little bulbous so this is a congested liver from heart failure with secondary changes in the gallbladder. Or the case on the right where we see also an edematous gallbladder wall, there is a, a soft stone or sludge ball within the gallbladder lumen with a lot of free fluid and this patient of course has liver cirrhosis. This case is also an informative case. This was a a uh, woman, again in her 30s, with uh, acute upper abdominal pain. Uh, there's a stone in the region of the gallbladder neck. The patient was quite acutely tender in the upper abdomen. But I would suggest to you that this gallbladder is not tensely distended. And in fact, if you look at the margin of the gallbladder adjacent to the liver, it has a concave appearance uh, internally rather than convex externally. So this prompted us to go in uh, again and see the patient, take a history 
and do a very careful sonographic evaluation where ultimately we saw this focal enhancement of the peritoneal stripe in the right upper quadrant overlying the liver with the patient lying left posterior oblique. And you'll notice that this focal enhancement uh, exhibits some reverberation artifacts suggesting free air. Confirmed at CT scan, uh, where we see an inflammatory process in the right upper quadrant with the free air from a perforated duodenal ulcer. And in fact, the gallbladder is inflamed here, but it's secondarily inflamed from inflammation tracking up the duodenohepatic ligament rather than primarily inflamed from an obstructing stone in the gallbladder neck. So perforated duodenal ulcer mimicking acute cholecystitis. Or another example of a patient with acute right upper quadrant pain where the gallbladder is somewhat distended but there were no gall stones, there is some pericholecystic fluid. Again, prompted us to go and see the patient show us exactly uh, where the tenderness was, which was in fact a slightly infralateral to the gallbladder. And when we examined this area, we noted some focal thickening of the hepatic flexure of the colon with a surrounding inflammatory mass and inflamed diverticulum, which had perforated with this tract of extraluminal gas. So acute diverticulitis of the hepatic flexure of the colon. Let's leave the gallbladder now and go on to talk about other conditions that can mimic the presentation of acute uh, cholecystitis. And we'll start with cholidocolithiasis. And uh, depending on the laboratory, there are varying sensitivities for ultrasound. Uh, with uh, four cholidocolithiasis, but 70% sensitivity is probably uh, a good conservative uh, estimate. If the ducts are dilated, this will improve detection, and some advances in technology over the years, such as harmonic imaging, may also improve detection. Uh, to examine the CBD in its entirety can be quite uh, difficult, um, to uh, see the distal CBD um, uh, sometimes maneuvers uh, such as setting the patient partially upright and turning the patient right posterior oblique may be beneficial. Uh, for the proximal and mid-CBD, it can often be well seen with the patient supine or left posterior oblique and even the distal CBD can often be seen with the patient supine if you use uh, compression to move a gas out of the duodenal loop. Here's an example of a patient who presented to emergency with acute right upper quadrant pain. The liver functions were notably abnormal. The intrahepatic bile ducts are markedly dilated. It's really important to follow these ducts uh, Centrally, do they all communicate, and in this case they did, and entered a markedly dilated common bile duct. Again, your job isn't complete. You must follow the dilated bile duct to establish the level and hopefully the cause of obstruction. And in this case, we see a large gallstone as the cause of obstruction. Uh, some of you are probably saying, well, for such a large stone, it really doesn't exhibit all that much shadowing. And it's important to note that this image was taken with Sono CT, so there are many angles of insonation dispersing uh, the uh, shadow as a result. Now, if you suspect there may be a stone in the common bile duct, but you can't actually find it with ultrasound, in other words, you see biliary dilation, you can follow it to the CBD, but the distal CBD is obscured, and you can't actually establish the level or cause of obstruction. And if in your department you have difficulty accessing MRI in an acute setting, CT is a very good option. And here is such a patient where at the level of obstruction we can see some high attenuation within the CBD. 
Now the problem with this image is that intravenous contrast has been administered and it's impossible to say if this obstruction is caused by a stone or enhancing soft tissue. So if you're going to look for a stone with CT, the teaching point is that you must include a non-enhanced series. As we see here, uh, the stone is now visible. So when protocoling these cases, it's critical to include a non-enhanced series. But MRI obviously is very, very uh, uh, sensitive and specific for stones if you do have access to a, a magnet in the acute setting. Now other things within the common bile duct uh, can cause pain. Here is a patient who on day one had a transjugular liver biopsy and returned to the emergency room on day three with acute right upper quadrant pain. Sonographic images show uh, blood within the gallbladder lumen and on careful assessment of the CBD we see echogenic material so this patient has bleeding post biopsy with blood in the gallbladder and hemobilia as a cause of biliary colic. Or another uh, older case, but a case worth keeping, where the image on the left was taken at 10.30 a.m. in the morning and shows a linear structure within the CBD. There was no history of intervention in this patient uh, and a follow-up uh, image taken an hour later shows a completely normal CBD. So what was this linear structure? Well, all was considered the possibility of a parasitic infection, in this case ascariasis, as a cause of the patient's biliary colic. Here's another patient. This patient had a history of jaundice for about three weeks, but was brought to the emergency room on the morning of this ultrasound scan with acute right upper quadrant pain. This was the best image I could get of the bile ducts and CBD, which are clearly dilated. And then there's this large cystic structure more distally. And initially I was wondering about the possibility of uh, some type of colidocal cyst. But another important teaching point, if you ever see a cystic structure with ultrasound, always put on Doppler. And what a surprise I got when I realized that this was a large aneurysm or pseudoaneurysm obstructing the CBD. We brought the patient immediately for a CT angiogram confirming this large aneurysm of the hepatic artery. And you'll notice as we scan through, this aneurysm is now quite irregular in shape, which in combination with the history of acute pain likely reflects impending rupture. And this patient was taken fairly immediately to the operating room for a successful repair. Ascending cholangitis, often a clinical diagnosis, patients with pain, fever, high white cell count, abnormal liver function. Um, these patients can be very ill. An ultrasound is important to look for a treatable biliary dilation and may also show thickening of the wall of the bile ducts. It may also show an obstructing cause such as a gold stone and of course can be very helpful for guiding intervention. Here's an example where we see the CBD in transverse with a markedly thickened hypoechoic wall in a patient with ascending cholangitis. Or another elderly patient who presented in septic shock to our emergency room, we did this ultrasound quite urgently. Uh, we can see the portal vein uh, highlighted here with a very dilated CBD anterior to the portal vein filled uh, with uh, echogenic material, a combination of soft stones and sludge. So if you see a nil patient, uh, or even not such a nil patient, and you confidently identify uh, stones or a stone in the CBD and ultrasound, those patients can go directly for definitive treatment with ERCP once they've been resuscitated with intravenous fluids and given appropriate antibiotic coverage. And here's that patient uh, 
who went to ERCP uh, confirming um, the stones and sludge uh, within the um, lumen. Again, the teaching point, go directly to ERCP if you identify the stone with ultrasound. Recurrent pyogenic cholangiohepatitis, another important condition common in Asia, although we also see a large number of the cases of this condition in Toronto, felt to be associated with the liver fluke planorcus uh, sinensis. Patients develop soft intrahepatic uh, biliary stones. Uh, segments most commonly affected are segments 2 and 3 of the left lobe and then segments 6 and 7 of the right lobe. The hallmark of this condition is associated uh, atrophy of liver parenchyma in the affected uh, segments because of the recurrent inflammation with hypertrophy of the parenchyma in the healthy segments. Um, the definitive treatment is surgical. Here is a typical uh, ultrasound appearance, a sagittal image of the right lobe where we see uh, soft stones uh, with um, vague posterior shadowing involving the segment uh, 6 intrahepatic uh, bile ducts. These stones are e easily overlooked because of the associated parenchymal atrophy as the portal triads and affected bile ducts uh, migrate to the capsular surface of the liver with uh, hypertrophy of the healthy liver replacing the atrophied segments. Here's a different patient with two images. Uh, again, a, a sagittal image through the left lobe shows disorganized liver parenchyma. It's quite a difficult image to interpret. Uh, there may be a stone centrally. And then a, uh, an image of the right lobe, again showing intrahepatic biliary stones in uh, bile ducts that are close to the liver surface. And then we look at a non-enhanced CT scan on this patient, and we can very nicely see here the intrahepatic biliary stones in segment 6 sitting right on the capsular surface of the liver because of the marked atrophy of the involved segments and then hypertrophy of the healthy segment uh, 5 and uh, 8 replacing the atrophied liver parenchyma. Liver abscess uh, can be pyogenic uh, or amoebic. Patients present with pain and fever can mimic the clinical presentation of acute cholecystitis. With pyogenic abscesses, no underlying cause can be established in about 50% of patients, and these are often anaerobic abscesses. In the remaining 50%, where an underlying cause can be determined, the bile ducts are the uh, most likely cause with the gut, either acute diverticulitis or acute appendicitis, in second place. But uh, infection can spread from other parts of the body, uh, osteomyelitis or uh, infective endocarditis. The treatment for liver uh, abscess, it's generally image-guided percutaneous uh, drainage. Here's an example, a large abscess in the right lobe of the liver with a very typical appearance uh, with cystic and solid components, and this should pose no difficulty at all for diagnosis in the right clinical context. But here's another patient with similar symptoms of pain, fever, malaise. We see a large mass in the right lobe of the liver, but in this case, the mass appears much more solid. And it's important to realize that with ultrasound, early liquefaction uh, can have a solid appearance. Here we see the CT scan from the same day showing early liquefaction. So ultrasound can be misleading and give an appearance of a solid mass when in fact what one is dealing with is a liver abscess. Now finally, we'll uh, briefly discuss masses that rupture and bleed. And these masses, of course, uh, cause 
acute pain in the right upper quadrant. Uh, uh, the main culprits are hepatic adenoma and hepatocellular carcinoma, although other masses can bleed. Uh, the important way to distinguish between the first two is know your patient, so the patient profile. Adenomas most often occur in premenopausal women on the birth control pill, whereas hepatocellular carcinoma occurs in patients who have known chronic liver disease, are most often cirrhotic, and often have chronic hepatitis C or B. So here's a young woman with a 10-year history of taking the birth control pill. On the unenhanced image, we see hemoperitoneum with a suggestion of a uh, large mass in segment 2. That mass looks irregular. It has a large cleft uh, within it and at surgery, of course, had a ruptured adenoma. The adenomas that bleed bristly and cause uh, problems with uh, hypotension and shock are generally the lesions that are subcapsular and rupture freely into the peritoneal cavity. Here's another patient with a similar history presented acutely to the emergency room with a pain and a drop in hemoglobin. We see this large heterogeneous mass exophytic from segment 5 of the liver, an acute blood clot over the liver capsule. This patient had a 20-year history of chronic hepatitis, so this is hepatocellular carcinoma that has spontaneously ruptured and bled. And finally, a woman in her 40s who was also on the birth control pill presented one Saturday night to our emergency room with acute uh, upper quadrant pain and a drop in blood pressure. Ultrasound showed a large mass in the right lobe of the liver, a very heterogeneous mass. Uh, CT uh, confirmed the mass with high attenuation centrally, uh, suggesting blood within the mass and uh, some hemoperitoneum which extended uh, to the pelvis. And uh, we anticipated that this too would be a hepatic adenoma, but we're surprised when we gave contrast on CT to see the typical peripheral nodular enhancement of a large cavernous hemangioma. And this was uh, confirmed at surgery. This was a large uh, spontaneous bleed and a cavernous hemangioma, uh, which can occur but is extremely rare. If hemangiomas bleed, um, it's usually as a result of minor trauma or during pregnancy. So that brings me to the end of the presentation. Uh, to briefly summarize uh, our teaching uh, points from today's talk, uh, first of all, be very slow to diagnose acute, uncomplicated cholecystitis if the gallbladder is not tensely distended. At least uh, slow down, uh, have a very careful conversation uh, with the patient about their um, symptoms and evaluate the patient uh, very carefully uh, with ultrasound in the area of maximal tenderness because it may be that there is another cause for the patient's pain. Remember in cases of acute cholecystitis to spend additional time looking for the obstructing stone in the gallbladder neck and cystic duct as this will add confidence to your diagnosis. Remember, when you're imaging the gallbladder, to always uh, look for underlying gallbladder cancer, as this is critical information uh, for the laparoscopic surgeon, and they will appreciate being forewarned if you do have a suspicion that there may be an underlying gallbladder cancer. Remember, when distinguishing air from calcium, the answer lies in the shadowing, reverberation artifact with air, clean shadowing from calcium. Remember that if you identify a stone in the CBD on ultrasound, there's no need for MRCP. That patient can go directly to ERCP for definitive treatment. Remember that if you don't have access to MRCP, when you suspect that there may be a stone in the CBD on ultrasound, 
but you're unable to demonstrate it because of limited visibility, you can use CT, but if looking for a stone on CT, you must include an unenhanced scan. Remember, anywhere in the body, if you see a cystic mass, it's worth uh, uh, interrogating that cystic mass with Doppler ultrasound, as every so often you will uncover an unsuspected aneurysm. Remember that an abscess may appear solid on ultrasound in its early stages, and in this situation, CT with contrast is helpful to demonstrate early liquefaction. And finally, if uh, giving a differential for a liver mass that has ruptured and bled, that a differential is best based on the patient's profile. A woman on the birth control pill, most likely to be a hepatic adenoma, whereas a patient with chronic liver disease and cirrhosis, most likely to be hepatocellular carcinoma. Thank you very much.